Greetings. Back to Energy 101. And we're another exciting day in energy resources. We're going to look at wind today. We looked at solar last time. We've looked at the fossil fuels. Uh, we're looking at the renewable energy resources. Um, you know, before we know how to use them, we need to know how you get them, where they are, how, mu how much there is, and uh, how diffuse they are. So let's look at wind today. Wind energy is the biggest contributor from renewable energy of all the sources, much more higher than solar and uh, much higher than the renewable biomass. It, and so it's, it's an important renewable energy resource. Uh, the way we reap the energy, of course, the wind energy, is with wind turbines. Here's just a shot of a small wind farm. Uh, on land, wind farms are generally fairly small uh, relative to offshore wind farms, which you'll look at also, but uh, uh, unless they're out in the middle of the desert, which, of course, is good because they they generally have good wind resources and high average winds out in the deserts. Uh, this is an offshore wind farm that is very prevalent in Europe. Here's a shot of this a beautiful view when you go out and look at them. I made a trip in, in 2005, I guess it was, six, uh, over and visited several of the offshore wind farms in Europe. Uh, of course, servicing them is more expensive. Uh, constructing them is more expensive out in the water than on land. Uh, one good thing is, though, it's easier to ship the very long uh, blades that you have. And uh, so th those are the, you notice they're on pilings. And those pilings, of course, put them up off the surface of the earth, uh, whether it be land or water. And one thing we find is that energy resources, the average wind speed increases with a height above the earth's surface of water or uh, land. Uh, it also varies with geographical location. Some areas just meteorologically have a higher average wind speed, which is what we want for high energy density and high, lots of resources, versus other geographical locations. They, I just mentioned height above the surface of the earth is uh, turns out very important, as we'll see. So we'd like to put them up on a very high piling. Well, that's uh, economically, that's very viable when you have a very large wind turbine because the pylon is only 15% or so of the total cost of the wind turbine. But uh, if you're putting up a small one horsepower, one kilowatt size turbine, uh, if you put it up too high, you'll be spending more money on your pylon than you will on the wind turbine itself. But uh, it, of course, it, it varies by weather. Uh, and if you get a stormy condition, you get high winds. If you get a calm, it's calm. You have differences in night and day because of the solar heating of the earth. And uh, of course, by, as we've already said, the different geographical locations. So again, and it varies, by the way, the averages vary from winter to summer. Uh, it's the opposite of what sometimes we might assume regarding month of the year is that the uh, average wind speed is generally almost all the regions is higher in the winter than the summer. Uh, that's good if, uh, if you have a peak demand for electricity in the winter for heating versus summer, but when you get into the south, for instance, you would like to have more electricity and need more electricity in the summers for air conditioning. So it <coughs> the wind energy, particularly where you have summer peaking energy demand, electrical demand, uh, doesn't really match the annualized load. But we'll look at the average, a annual average uh, on wind maps like we looked at the wind maps for solar. But they're a little more straightforward because this time it doesn't depend on the orientation. We can always point the wind turbine into the wind. These turbines pivot around the pylon on huge bearings. And uh, so they're always pointing into the wind. And that's not a big deal. By the way, you, you notice the uh, blades in that case, the case we're looking at here is pitched so that they're basically perpendicular to the, to the wind. 
and so the, that's in the stop lock position. If the wind gets below a certain speed or it gets above a certain speed that could cause damage to the turbine, uh, they uh, turn the blades into the wind and lock it down because, to prevent damage. But, uh, but let's look at uh, how they, we classify winds. You, you classify winds by wind power class, one through seven, and that uh, indicates the range of wind power density. And that's uh, the watts per, when it says that they're of class one, uh, zero to 200 watts of kinetic energy in the wind per, cube, per square meter of, of the area that you're capturing of the wind. So if your rotor blade is in its circumference in this circle is capturing uh, 10 square meters, then that means that the total watts of kinetic, kinetic energy or power in that uh, in that 10 square meters is uh, up to 200 watts per uh, up to 2,000 for the class one. Uh, the power density is a little bit non-intuitive. You would think that the because of the kinetic energy is all we think about is always one half mv squared. That as the wind speed goes up, the uh, power would go up to the square of the velocity but it actually goes up with a cube. And the reason it does is because it's, it, the kinetic energy per unit mass of air goes up as the, uh, as the speed goes up. So if you double the wind speed, the kinetic energy per unit mass goes up by a factor of four. Two squared is four, two times two. But, it, but the power density goes up by the cube because the amount of mass is flowing through the wind turbine goes up proportional to the velocity. So the power density in watts is, uh, go, goes up by the cube, which is really makes the higher wind speeds pay off uh, liberally because if you double the wind speed, the power that you get out of the turbine in kilowatts, a given turbine, will go up by the, a factor of eight. If you double the wind speed, the power coming out by the generator is goes up by a factor of eight. So it's really sensitive to wind speed. The economics of wind farms is really sensitive to wind speeds uh, because of that cubic relationship. We'll look at that a little more later. Here's a wind map. Again, this one comes from NRAIL. Uh, they got good map resources. Uh, and we've said that it varies with the wind speed as this one shows, varies with the height above the surface. And this is about at 100 feet. So wind maps aren't any good unless you know at what height is taken. This one, as you look across the top up here, uh, you look across the top, it's uh, at 30 meters. U U.S. annual average wind speed at 30 meters. Uh, they're about 3.3 feet per meter. So that's about 100 feet. Uh, that's 100 feet uh, above the surface. Uh, looking at the diagram, looking at the map, we can see that the, over here in the southeast, where I am in Atlanta, it's dark green, which is way down here with a uh, w average wind speed of around four meters per second. That's not economical. It's, it's you can you can get electricity from a wind turbine at that speed, but the economics are really not going to work and by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, if you get out here and get the red areas, now you're up to about seven meters per second if we look there. If we take meters per second times 2.5, you get miles per hour. So a, uh, a wind speed of seven, I mentioned that, the, that the, the orange and red out here is about seven, six and a half to seven meters per second. Well, that's two, two and a half times seven is about 17 miles per hour. So that's a pretty good wind speed on average. That's the average wind speed 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Sometimes it's higher than 17 miles per hour, but sometimes it's lower. So you can see why 
uh, wind turbines tend to be out here in the Midwest. And uh, over here, again, at, at 100 feet above the surface out here in the northwest, there, there's not much. Now, there are some regions that, uh, particularly around Portland area, that does have some good, good wind speeds, but that's a very localized situation. Let's move up to a higher height now. Uh, let's move up to 300 feet because the new larger wind turbines are placed on pylons about 100 feet. Now, the color coding for the wind speed is exactly the same as it was in the previous uh, map. Same, same color coding. Whoop. Get it here in a minute. Uh, same color coding as we had before, but you notice the dark green is essentially totally gone away. So the lowest now that we're showing even in the southeast is around four and a half, five meters per second. So that's uh, five meters per second with the lighter green here would uh, be about 12 miles per hour, average speed of 12 miles per hour. That's still uh, not, not really economically viable, but you notice you've got to spend some money to put it up on a high pylon of 300 feet. Uh, 300 feet is a football length in, in height above the surface of the earth. Uh, it's, it's 80 meters, 80 meters, again, getting some conversion factors is 3.3 uh, 3.3 uh, to give you uh, feet. So 80 times times 3.3 uh, is about 270, 280, somewhere in there. I I'd use approximate signs that we don't no need to get bogged down in uh, decimal points here. But you notice you really out here in, in the uh, uh, Rockies, you really get some high wind speeds out there around uh, above eight, eight, nine meters per second, which is averaging over 20 miles per hour. Now, this also shows offshore, which the previous slide didn't. It shows offshore, but the first thing to notice about the offshore is that as soon as you get to the coast and move offshore, looking over here in the Atlantic coast, the wind speed goes up, because when you look at the chart, it goes up dramatically compared to on, line, on land. So on land, you really don't have any commercially viable uh, wind energy, wind resource out in the eastern coast there. But as soon as you move offshore, you get some dark purples that's the same as it is out here. But as I've already mentioned, unfortunately, it takes more money to build the turbines out in the ocean and requires uh, more to maintain them. Same way on the west coast. But uh, another thing you've got to be worried about when you're putting them offshore is the depth of the water. Uh, current technology, 75, 100 feet depth is about as deep as you, we really go now with the pylons. Uh, the, the next slide, this one shows the uh, just offshore by itself. But you can see again, same, same, uh, uh, same chart here, and. Uh, See if I can get it. Just, oh, there we go. Same chart, and this actually shows uh, miles per hour as well as meters per second uh, uh, here. But that's the reason offshore is, it looks a lot better, and people are pushing trying to get more offshore wind. The first offshore wind farm in the U.S. has been permitted only recently. It hasn't started construction yet. It's Cape Wind off of Nantucket. And... Uh, uh, hopefully will supposed to be operational 2014 or so. Uh, they've had some uh, obstacles they've had to overcome. But uh, offshore wind has, has a good, wind, good potential because of the high resources offshore relative to on land, as we see from these maps. Okay. And uh, if we go to the uh, source of these maps, we find NRAIL again. And you can download these and take a look at them. And this is the, the page here that uh, has got all the maps. And it's got uh, some low resolution and high resolution. Uh, you can see, you can pick the map <coughs> and uh, take a look at it yourself. And we'll have you do that. OK, so that gives us an overview of wind resources and why a lot of the wind farms are out in the mid, Midwest and Southwest.
and uh, why there are not, not any wind farms in the southeast and, north, and east and coast in general. Okay, thank you. See you next time.